Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chaya Chats. My name is Ruben Thomas, and I'm very happy to have with us today Reverend Father Jake Korean. Uh, Jake Utchin has been serving at St. Stephen's Orthodox Church in Houston for the past eight years. We're very excited to have him here. Utchin, thanks for coming on with us. Thanks for having me, Ruben. Great to be here. Yes, it's nice to talk to you, Utchin. And I'm really excited about the topic that we have today. As most of y'all can see, the topic is the struggle that no one talks about. I know we've kept it kind of vague there in the beginning, but today's topic is something that I think many people struggle with, if not most people. And that is the topic in the struggle of pornography. So, Achin, I know this was something important to you that you wanted to address. And this is not something we normally hear addressed at all in, in any type of church setting or social setting. So why did you feel like this topic should be addressed in this podcast? Well, Ruben, before I start, because it is such a difficult topic to talk about, I do want to start with a small prayer, and then we'll get going. Barakamor, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So when you asked me to talk about, uh, to do one of these, I just thought, what would be interesting for this platform, you know, because it's kind of unique being online. And, you know, it's informal, and we're having a discussion, and I thought, you know, one thing that really doesn't get enough discussion, enough attention, I would say, in our pastoral ministry and in the church, life of the church, would be this struggle of pornography and masturbation. Yet, it's it's something that is affecting the whole society, affecting not just Christians, but everybody. The whole uh, humankind uh, are, are, is affected by this industry. And we know that it's a problem, because even as the statistics show us, it's a billion-dollar industry. Uh, It has more viewership than Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter combined, which is something I was pretty startled to read about. If you think how many people get on Amazon, how many people watch Netflix, how many people get on Twitter, all of that combined, all of that combined, porn has more viewership. Uh, Pornography has more viewership, and it's, it's it's a lucrative industry. It's a widespread issue, and we can't afford not to talk about this. We have to we, we have to address it, because even in the early church it was addressed. St. Paul talks about it throughout the scriptures, it's talked about. Uh, it's interesting, the word in Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek, and the word that's used for uh, fornication, what we read about, is pornea. So pornography actually comes from a Greek word, which means pornea, fornication, uh, and you see St. Paul kind of address that throughout in his letters over and over again, because it's a major issue then, and in the, it's an even uh, greater issue now. And even now, as you said, the industry has grown so much, you know, even from when you were growing up and then to when I was growing up, and now when kids are growing up in high school and college, we've seen like this massive increase in the exposure and the availability. Um, and have you seen how that affects when people start getting into pornography now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, one of the things we have to recognize, especially as we have this uh, upcoming generation, is that the internet has changed everything in this struggle. This struggle has always been there. I mean, pornography has always been there. I mean, at least, you know, we can understand since media has been out of of, uh, print and video, that's been there. But the difference is now is the internet has changed this struggle in three different ways. I was watching a TED Talk on this, and they were explaining that. But and I'll tell you the three different ways the internet has changed the struggle. Uh, the first way is accessibility. There was a time where you had to be 18 or older to get access to any kind of pornography, being buying a video or, or a magazine or whatever it is, or you had to know somebody who had that. So it was some, not something that anybody could just stumble upon. Now with the internet, you know, you can run into pornography by accident, even on a website, in a search, or whatever it may be. Inadvertently, you can come across it. Just clicking on buttons, clicking links, you know, you can do it. So uh, it, that accessibility has totally changed. Anybody can access it at any time. And so that's a major concern. So that's definitely uh, a factor. The second one is it's affordable because it's free. There was a time when you had to pay for all of it. You had to go to a store or buy it or get a subscription or whatever it is. Somebody had to pay for it. And and that's how it was. And now with the internet, it's just free. And it's all getting paid for through advertisements and things like that. But it's just free and abundant and accessible. So it's accessible, it's affordable. And then the third thing is it's anonymous with the internet. It's because before, let's say if there was a magazine or a video or a DVD or whatever it was, 
somebody had to have it and hold it and have a possession of it and it had to be hidden somewhere or whatever it was they had there was there was a a trail there with the in, with the internet anonymously anybody can access anything for free and so what that's done and especially uh with high speed internet what that's done is just allow people, especially at a young age, to indulge in this and uh, create a, a very addictive pattern. And it's happening at a younger age. They said the average age that I was, uh, when I was reading about it, was that about 10 or 11 years old is when a, a child first stumbles onto pornography. Maybe first out of curiosity, just it's. But the the danger is that this is becoming now the, you know, sexual education for the upcoming generation. And even as we said over the years, as this has become more rampant, you know, we've seen everything from music into movies, into TV shows, everything's become a lot more sexualized in nature. I mean, you, we even think even Indian cinema or Indian shows, generally they're probably more conservative, but even over the years, right, everything becomes a little bit more sexualized in nature. And I'm sure that these two are related to each other. Absolutely, man. I mean, I was, you know, when you, okay, so like the question comes is like, you know, parents, did our parents ever talk to us about this issue? And the answer is no, right? No, no, none of us growing up 30 years ago or in, in our, you know, when we were growing up in the 80s and 90s before internet, parents didn't sit us down and say, this is what it is. And, and this is what you have to be watchful of and mindful of and all that. No. But the difference was the, the, the television, the movies, especially the television that we watched, was what society should be aspiring to. For example, shows maybe like Full House or Family Matters or things like that. I think there are shows that we should be, there, there are values and family values that we should be striving for as a society. And, you know, really with reality television and just the way things are going from the 90s onwards, it, it went from... What we strive for to our, just emphasizing our, our fallenness as human beings. And so all the vices that we struggle with is now just putting put on display. And now we're just becoming desensitized and, and everything's getting normalized. And it's so now there's no struggle for virtue. There's no struggle for virtue. I joke around because, I, you know, uh, when I was talking to somebody about this, like Friends, actually, I feel like although it's a hit show and everybody watched it, that's really one of the turning point shows where, you know, all of these values start to get, you know, the, the striving for good family values start to decrease and you start to see just this, you know, very promiscuous type of lifestyle kind of being put out as normal. As, you know, there was one episode I remember where in Friends where they get pornography for free and, and they, they don't want to change the channel or turn it off. Uh, because, you know, they just get it for free and they're just nonstop watching it. And then at the end of it, I think I remember they get sick of it. But, you know, back, you know, we were watching that episode. I watched that episode not thinking much about the, the problem of that, right? Because you're just watching for the comedy or whatever. But there slowly our values are getting affected, right? When we get uh, kind of, uh, and we just have to be aware of it. I'm not saying that, you know, we can't watch anything. I'm just saying that we just have to be mindful, of what the messaging is nowadays when we watch things. And it, it does affect, it does affect us. And that leads into the next part that I kind of want to get into is the effect that pornography has on us. I mean, there's so many different ways that it can impact us. And I think in a physical manner, psychological, emotional manner, you know, it's, it can be very damaging to us. There is a element of addiction to pornography and to the physical aspect too of how do we treat our bodies? How do we, how do we view our bodies? Um, and can you kind of get into that a little bit, what you see in your ministry of how that changes our viewpoint, especially starting at a young age? So if we can imagine that, you know, a 10-year-old, 11-year-old is getting exposed to pornography and starting to watch, you know, what that means and what that's, what are the effects of it? You know, in the short term, what's, what we're seeing is it's really shaping the mind of boys and girls, guys and girls, as they are uh, growing up as to what is to be expected and what they're entitled to. For guys, it may be, this is what how things are done. Um, this is what I'm entitled to. This is what, what should be done. And especially if I am to get into a relationship, this is what it should be. And girls also get affected by this because they start to think, this is what a guy expects. 
this is what is expected of me as a girlfriend, maybe. And they start, both sides start comparing themselves to this, to this totally unrealistic, totally not God designed way of of sex which is we have to remember that god is the one who has created it in a in the covenant of marriage uh and it, and instead of that it's now being warped uh in the minds of uh especially our young generation but even anybody who's consuming it uh in this way it it, it can really lead to people objectifying the opposite sex and really leading to a selfish conquest and as you mentioned um, pornography is addictive it's very interesting to see that it's the same pathway, and they're doing studies of on this, same pathway as alcohol, as smoking. It's the same pathway of the dopamine pathway of reward system. And so basically what's happening is this curiosity is now leading to habit, which then leads to addiction. And basically, similarly, you can imagine, you know, somebody who, who drinks, um, they have to drink more and more to get the same buzz. And it's the same right. thing with pornography. It's the same thing. Like to get the same effect, you have to consume more and more of it and different types of it. And and I think that's what has led the industry to just keep ratcheting up the aggression, the uh, perversion of it. I was, you know, there was a TED talk talking about that and saying how, you know, the, even the pornography that we see nowadays, it is not what it was even 20, 30 years ago. And a lot of that is due to the internet and just how this is getting consumed, that that more of this is needed. And it's really warping uh, the whole minds of the of, of all of all who consume on a regular basis, especially our young people. And when we talk about it being addictive, yeah, it starts at a young age, but I'm sure you've seen even people who are married where mm-hmm. pornography is still part of their lives. You know, it doesn't just end you know, after they grow up, right? I mean, once it starts, it, it kind of takes a hold of you. That's right. I mean, it really, you know, we can think about this, 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 it starts off as this curiosity and maybe this habit. But what happens is when they, when relationships get enter, entered into, it really starts in, increasing the chance of more premarital sexual activity, uh, expectations in that. And we may think that, okay, well, once I'm married, uh, this may go away. Right. Uh, because, you know, then I'm married and, and I, I have a place for that. And it's not necessarily the case because in marriage, what sex is in marriage is different than what pornography is. Pornography is very selfish. It's all about the self. It's all about what I want. Whereas in marriage, you know, sex is actually consummating of giving to, of yourself to another person completely. There's nothing more you can offer somebody that you're married to. You've, if you can think about it this way, you know, before marriage and when sex is involved, there's so much doubt. There's so much wonder, like, especially when guy with guys and girls, you know, for guys, it may be like, this is how I, you know, enjoy this relationship. This is how she shows me that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worth uh, being her boyfriend or whatever. For girls, maybe this is how I can get him to love me. You know, I remember Bishop Michael used to tell all the time that in relationships, you know, there may be different aspects to it, emotional, physical, mental. And for guys, oftentimes the physical side is often the more important or or inflated side. And then for girls, it can be the emotional. And so what happens is girls will or guys will say, I love you to get sex from a girl. And girls will get, give sex to get a guy to tell them, I love, I love you. So, you know, it becomes this very transactional thing. Uh, and it, even though it may not be said so, as much, but it, it can be felt like that. In marriage, you've, both the husband and the wife have, before God in the Holy Church and before the whole community, have made a commitment, not just to each other, but to God, that I am going to obey and to love this person, even when it's hard even when I don't want to. So sex in that context is such a, a um, different experience, such a selfless experience too, I would say. Because uh, you've given yourself. There's nothing more you can give. You've given yourself to this person uh, before God and before the community. And so I think that that distinction uh, needs to be made there. But we can forget about that. And sometimes when our marriages get hard even, we may think, you know what? It's Because there's work to be put into a marriage that may lead to sex, uh, sexual union. 
And remember, God has designed that. I, I don't want to. God has designed that for uh, when He says the two shall be one flesh. There's yeah. actually a dimension, a physical dimension to that, right? But when marriage gets hard, you know, there are times where when we're angry, when we're upset, we we, we then turn to the self. Instead of turning to the other, we turn to the self and we do selfish things. And pornography and masturbation can be part of that. And I'm glad you talk, we talked about the addictive nature and how it's almost, in one sense, it can be a craving that we need to satisfy our own self-desires. Um, and then, like you said, right now, sometimes we use it as an out when we feel like whatever we're in right now is too hard. And like you yeah. said, it, it's a lot of self-pleasure and it's very like instantaneous gratification. You know, we know it's always there. It's always accessible to us. Um, and this sort of brings me to my next question. Like, we've talked about it being, starting at a young age. Um, but why is it that things of a sexual nature, why is it so hard to struggle against that? Why do we feel so attracted to engage in those behaviors and find it so hard to remove ourselves from it? I think, you know, one of the things, and we could even ask this in another way of, like, <sighs> we may feel like it's even... Uh, not fair. And what I mean by that is we say that God, when a person gets into middle school, that a person starts having these feelings and these desires, whatever it may be, uh, towards the opposite sex. Yet the church is telling me that I can't do anything about it till I'm married to somebody. And so I think one of the things we have to kind of just remember from a human standpoint is that in ancient times, people did get married in teenage years. Right, like it, marriage was something that was done in teenage years, and even if you look a couple of generations before, I bet you could see that people got married younger. Right, it was like maybe in their late teens or their twenties for sure. But nowadays, you wouldn't be surprised to find people getting married in their thirties, even. Right, like that wouldn't shock you, you know. And so that I think is a we have to acknowledge as a church, as a as a society that that's a challenge. Like we can't just like like pretend like okay, somebody has. Uh, starts having the feelings of lust at a, a middle school age, and they're not supposed to do anything for about it for 15, 20 years. I mean, that's that's tough. So part of it is, I think we need to understand as a, as a church and as each individual person also that we need to start struggling early, because if we start the struggle early against this and understand its proper context, what God has designed it for in a communion, in a covenant of marriage, we prepare ourselves for marriage at an earlier age. Right now, we may say that, okay, you know, we all have school, but a lot of people get done with school in their early 20s. And yet, many of them, th though they may be economically ready, they can financially support, they may be not in their maturity, in their spirituality, ready to be married. Right. And so that's what we really need to think about, uh, especially for the next generation, is that from middle school and high school, we start dealing with this so that when a person's in college and finishing up college, they can actually start preparing for marriage. And so even if they do get into a relationship in college, there can be a goal of like we can maintain our purity till marriage. And, you know, because marriage is not 10 years away. You know, it can be something within a few years and, you know, this can be talked about and discussed. And, I don't, you know, I think that's something that we have to empathize with, which is the struggle of, you know, and I think a lot of times we just kind of, you know, dismiss it and we say stuff like, oh, you know, this is the age, the hormones are raging, mm -hmm. you know, but, but I think we need to really be clear about it. Like, that's not something they should necessarily be ashamed of. It's part of humanity, but we just need to know that, okay, it's time to start struggling. It's time to start owning up and, and and taking asking for God's help to to struggle and the reason for that is so that when they get older they will continue to, it will make them a better person a better husband a better father a better person to be around in all aspects when they have that struggle in check versus being a slave to it and I think that brings up a good point of starting at a young age right when when we're exposed to it at such a young age, that's when we should start fighting against the struggle. And that sort of brings me to my next question about good practical habits on how to overcome the struggle, even from if you're looking at it from a young age to then when you're in a relationship, a young relationship, right? Because um, a lot of times, like we said in the beginning, you know, it's all around us, you know, the, through technology, through social media, you know, we're exposed to it almost 24-7. 
and none of us are going to forsake technology, right? So in this day and age, when we see it around us and we see society have that push to normalize it, how do we sort of fight against that? I think we have to, I think this is a step, right? Where we're talking about it in a, in a safe place, like in families and in the church, right? I think those are safe places. I think what happens a lot of times is people start talking about this either by their own, without talking to anybody, they just, you know, explore online or they talk to friends, if anything, right? If anything, but definitely not in the safest places, which are with families and within the the, the church, you know, I think those are safer places to really find out because otherwise what's happening is there's just this desensitization to sex and there's just, you know, and I think even we should be aware and we should tell people that these are the, the problems that will happen even taking away not just the spiritual separation from God that we may feel, the shame that we may feel, right? But even in addition to that, just our own formation of our brain, they even say they see changes in the brain because it's such an addiction on, on brain formation, on the way we look at people, on the way our, our, we're able to concentrate and focus, on the way that we interact with people. All of these things, I think, are effects that we need to be mindful of and we need to talk about. And we need to say, like, when we see all of this, it plays out even in the culture, you know, when we see increasing things like pedophilia and sexual misconduct, harassment. You may think, okay, well, these people are just anom anomalies who are just troubled people. But I bet all of that has its roots in pornography, right? I bet like when people, they, they don't, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's over a long period of time. So people need to know, like, this is what could happen, right? And at the same time, we have to kind of be mindful of the fact that that industry in itself, we don't want to contribute to it because that industry has a bunch of people who work in it who are you know, who have had a lot of troubled pasts. Many of them, it, they said an, an overwhelming number of sex workers are either have been molested, have really had troubled pasts, have uh, may, maybe many of them may be uh, victims of sex, sex trafficking, so even against their will. All of that is involved in that industry. So I think we should, you know, shed light on that too. So that's one side of it. But the mm -hmm. other side of it is, you know, is is to just say the the one side of it is just to say the the effects of pornography just in society and in in general and how this is a distortion of what God has intended. But the other side of it, I think, is we need to start realizing as parents, you know, as is that any even is each each individual person growing up should start thinking, I need to start addressing this in the church uh, with a spiritual father right? To talk to somebody about this and addressing it. And I think that goes a long way. I'm glad you brought up that point, because as you said, talking about it in a family setting about this specific issue is probably not something that crosses anyone's mind um, when they're younger. And, you know, by the time they're older, it, it's really not there. And I would say even when you go to your spiritual father, I think sometimes we feel a little embarrassed to even say it, right? Um, even if it's if we're talking about confession in a confession setting, we still feel that guilt, that embarrassment to even say those words. And what do you see as the best approach to that? You know, I think, first of all, you know, we, we, it's important for us to understand confession because I think we kind of know that it's part of the church, but I don't know if we really have grasped the full benefit that's being offered in confession. I think a lot of times we look at confession based on what we've seen maybe in movies and in TV where you kind of, especially in the Catholic understanding that we've seen where there's a screen door and somebody comes in and just makes a list of their sins mm -hmm. and walks out. And so maybe we even feel like that's the way it should be done. And I wouldn't give it that. Uh, I wouldn't take that approach with it. I don't think that's the orthodox approach of just listing and walking out. And I've said it, so I'm, I'm clear. I think you should look at it and all of us should look at it as a visit to the doctor. You know, when we go to the doctor you don't just list everything and walk out. You go to the doctor and you kind of say, okay, what's the thing that's been bothering you the most? And you talk about that. I mean, even in medical terms, we would say that's like the chief complaint. Like that's the main reason you came. And then there may be other things that are contributing to it that may be making it worse, making it better. And you don't just say, I have pain and you walk out. You kind of say, I have pain. This is where the pain is. This is, you know, it gets worse when I do this. It gets better when I do this. But, you know, I need to get better, you know. And so 
I would say, like, when we are looking to our spiritual father, our father confessor, the person that we go to over and over again, and it should be the same person, by the way. Uh, It should be the same person that we're going to. It's a relationship. Um, Just like, again, like a doctor, you wouldn't switch doctors every other visit. Um, It's the same thing with confession. You go to somebody who knows you so that when they come to you the next time, they're picking off, picking up where they left, where you left off and and, where, where's, where we fallen, where we gotten better. And I would say some things about it is, number one, you know, be specific. And what I mean by that is, you know, as I said, like, say what needs to be said. Don't try to, we shouldn't think, we should think to myself, to ourselves, am I being guarded about what I need to be saying? Should I, you know, say it? If it's pornography, it's pornography. If it's masturbation, it's masturbation. Uh, If it's sexual activity, if it's premarital sex, whatever it is, right? Whatever it is. But... I would, number one, say what it is, you know, just to, to have it out there. Uh, and it's not to inform the priest. It's for the therapy of the person, okay, that's, that's doing the confession. And the second thing is how often. The first thing is say what it is. And the second thing is how often. So is this every day? Is it once a week? Is it how many times a month? How many times? A, like, what is the frequency of what we're talking about? And the reason I say that is because that really helps us to understand even for our oneself how where is this problem at and you know where, where how should how should we address it how can we start getting better from it just like you would with any other addictive behavior by the way we never just say like this person's a smoker the next question is how many packs a day right right uh if you drink how many drinks a day how how much how much right how many glasses how many bottles whatever right so it's it's kind of that it's the same line of addiction and, but I would even say this with any sins that we are confessing, like it's good to be like when we say angry, because I, I get it. You could say, you know, I get angry, but you could all, it, it's much different when we say I get angry with my spouse and I haven't. I, and we were to the point where we don't talk for days and, you know, it's we're, we go to bed angry and we, you know, or whatever that like that's a whole different conversation. Right. That's a whole different confession in terms of receiving the healing for it. Uh, because once we're able to do that, that's where we're able to start the process of healing. It's just like in the doctor. If you don't say anything and if you just get vague about things, there's no there's no healing that can be done. And it's very much the same in spiritual life. The other benefit of that is as we get into married life and other problems that come up in our life, we don't have that embarrassment anymore. Once we've started this in our young age, even as a single person, Let's say we get into married life and we're having problems. We don't think, oh, you know, I can't talk to anybody about this. We got to figure this out. But rather we might think, let's go to Utch and let's talk about it, right? You, you'll be just more inclined or whatever that, that issue. There may be other issues that we may feel embarrassed about. But that, that shame is what keeps us from repentance, right? And so uh, the devil tries to keep us in that state of shame. Uh, but God is telling us, you know, come to me. And I will give you relief. I will give you relief from this this struggle. I will help you. And that's really what we have to be uh, mindful of. And I'm glad we're talking in depth about confession because I know, especially when you're younger, you I think most people, most young people, have a mindset that you know Achin's gonna think badly of me or Achin's gonna be judging me about all these things, right? And I think it's important for people to, to realize that everyone is familiar with sin. Right? It's not just something that is a struggle unique to yourself. Yeah, I would say, you know, it's quite the opposite. The person who comes very open and honest in a confession, there's a joy of repentance, right? Because God knows we're all sick. It's not like, you know, the priest is asking, how could you do that? Or why are you doing that? God knows we're sick. He's not asking, why did you do that? He knows. But he may ask, why don't you repent? Why don't you come to me and in, 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 in asking for forgiveness? You know, and the church has given us this path, you know, and I, uh, you know, we trust what the church has given us. Christ gave the apostles, uh, he breathes on them and he gives them, it says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he tells them, whatever sins you've forgiven, they're forgiven. Whatever you, they've been retained, whatever has been retained, they've been retained. So, you know, that we read in John chapter 20. And I, and at the same time, we read in, in, in James, confess your sins to one another. In the early church, what would happen is that people would actually confess in front of the whole church community, and then the priest would give the absolution. And now we have 
uh, where the priest represents the, the church in hearing the confession, but then also mediates in offering the absolution. And so this is something that's scriptural. This is something that's been practiced in the early church. And one of the things I think we should also keep in mind as we were kind of talking about pornography, which kind of touches into the struggle of purity and, and in relationships and even in marriage, we talked about it. I just want to touch on the fact that God is our ultimate soulmate and first love. So even, you know, when we talk about things like pornography and 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 fornication and all that kind of stuff, it's all not, first and foremost, it's infidelity to God. Because God is the one who is who is our first love, who we are called to. Uh, there's a famous verse in Song of Solomon, um, I have found the one whom my soul loves. And people think that refers just to marriage, but really what that's, the greater meaning is that we all are, our first love is Christ. And so even the person that we're married to is somebody that's going to help us on that love towards Christ and help exemplify Christ's love to each other. And so the the way that we can understand this is the person, anything that's outside of the covenant of God in marriage is fornication, right? So that could be premarital things, that could be other, but, you know, even even in marriage, if it's outside of the covenant of God, which is with our wife or our husband, um, it's, it's, it's considered um, infidelity to God. And I, I kind of want to touch on that, like, we should think that against you only have I sinned, against God, when I, when I go through this. And so uh, I think that's, you know, something that we can be remembering as well as we go through this. And I want to touch upon one more thing here is that you mentioned that confession and repentance is the start of that healing. Um, mm-hmm. For any struggle, and when we're talking about this specific one, I think it also means that after we leave confession, it doesn't mean that the struggle is over. Um, and then, like, we're still faced with those thoughts. You know, we'll still have those thoughts. We'll still, you know, have those images that we've seen come into our minds. What do you think is the best way to prevent those things from coming into our minds or controlling our thoughts? Yeah, you know, you bring up a good point because, you know, it's it's really an ongoing struggle, right? And I, I don't, I, you know, you, there's not a point where we just keep, where we're, ne- we're always vigilant against the struggle. Let me put it that way. We're always vigilant against the struggle. And so uh, let me just add on, I said about confession, but I can't, I also have to, say that there are some things that we have to be mindful of that the church teaches us, which is, one is praying with our bodies. So there's two things there that I want to talk about. One is prostrations. As you know, in the church, uh, the church teaches us to do prostrations when we pray, especially when we do the holy art, the old God. And if there's anything that the church tells us not to neglect, uh, even in the Philo Kalia, which is a book of spiritual writings uh, for over centuries, but one of the things it says in there is, do not neglect prostrations. And I've, you see this over and over again. Like, you can shorten things. You may, wanna, you may not have time to do all the hours of prayer. You may not have time to do certain things. But do not neglect prostrations. So everybody should be using their body to pray. That's the way that we can start practicing good things with our body. Because as St. Paul tells us, our body is the temple of God. And so doing prostrations is, is, is really a way of training the body to listen to the soul instead of the soul listening to the body, which is usually what happens, right? We're, we're led by our body and saying, this is what we got to do. And then what we're doing in spiritual life is actually the soul is taking control over the back towards Christ and in turn turning the body in the same direction. And so we do things like prostrations, making the sign of the cross. So that that definitely should be part of it. And the other thing was fasting. And when I say fasting, I don't just mean like abstaining from meat or you know, that's all part of it. But I really mean like not eating for extended periods of time on fasting days, right? Like so trying to go till uh, lunchtime, you know, on Wednesdays and Fridays and uh, other prescribed days, you know, try to do it the best you can. And I think there's there's value there. And St. John of the Ladder talks about this, um, the the benefits of fasting and how he even, he even he says that when we're gluttonous, we're more, it's easier for us to fall into lust. And he, I, I'm not sure if it's St. John of the Ladder who says this part or someone else, but I did hear, uh, and I, I thought, found it was a very interesting that he, he kind of says that the stomach and the genital organs are close to each other to remind us of how fasting 
can be uh, a, a weapon against lust. And then the, uh, vice versa, too. Like, if we lack in that, we can be we can fall into it more. And so, I, you know, I, I think that's also two, uh, other good ways. But at the end of the day, I think a spiritual father, uh, someone who you really go to, uh, will be able to help you each time. And what you, when you go back in confession, I encourage, you know, with the guidance of your spiritual father, he, he may tell you, when you know when you could come back or when to try and come back to develop a sense of frequency and everybody doesn't differ, different and i'm not saying that there's one set way there isn't but there should be an initiation of hey i need to come back i need to you know uh by the person uh who's confessing like setting time and and whenever you feel you need to come back and developing at least a minimum frequency and so in doing that i think you know what you see over time is improvement in the spiritual, uh, this this side of things. You you will you will see improvement, and and you will see advice given, and and counsel given based on the situation. But if this process is done correctly, you'll see improvement. I also wanted to add just one more thing, which was, even though we talk about confession and it's like we know that that's an orthodox thing, there are many even in our our brothers who are Protestant, they may not have confession. But you'll notice that they'll have something like an accountability group or they'll have something set up to where they have to come and say this before somebody. Maybe it's not a priest or a pastor, but they'll have a group of people that they have to say this to. I've seen many of these uh, in, in a lot of circles where they've had these things called accountability groups. Well, the church has always understood that. And it's also keep in mind that's the reason why anybody who's trying to overcome an addiction, they have to say it before another person, right? So whether that's alcohol, that's narcotic addictions or you know sex addiction addiction whatever yeah you have to that's part of the process of healing even psychologically but the church already has all of that encompassed in the sacrament of confession i'm glad that there is a lot of emphasis placed on the healing effects of confession a lot of times i think we tend to overlook it especially when we're in the midst of those struggles Um, yeah i mean I, i i think you know it's something once we develop get past it in that that initial shame and embarrassment, we really come to see the joy of uh, and the cathartic feeling that we can have in confession, that I'm forgiven, that God is with me. And this is really where God is really able to give us strength because we're putting light on this struggle. And Satan runs away from that. Like he can't, uh, that's where he's, he, he's helpless when we call on God in, the, in, in this way because we're so humble to do it. In, in the sacrament of confession, it's very humbling. It's very, uh, but at the same time, that's where God can work, where we're basically telling God, I need your help. And that's what St. John of the Ladder says, is like, if you try to do this on your own, you'll fail. But it's when you call on God in repentance that you can overcome. And, like, and I like what you said there about shedding light on it and Satan running away from that light. And that's something that that's the reason why I'm really happy that we're able to discuss this topic. I mean, as we said in the beginning, it's kind of a taboo subject, you know, in the church setting, especially. And even when we're amongst our friends, it rarely comes up. Um, So I'm very happy and grateful that, you know, at least we have a chance to address this issue. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I think, and it's not an easy subject to talk about, even in this platform, but definitely even just when going to a retreat or even in Bible studies, because, you know, there's a lot of vulnerability, vulnerability, there's a lot of maybe embarrassment and even just talking about it, but I, it needs to be out there. People need to know what the church has, and, and it has been talked about since the early church. The church fathers do address the struggle, and we should know that it's normal to be in the struggle and that it's uh, it's normal to have uh, these temptations, but also to know that we're not called to be complacent. We're not called to just give into it and say that that's part of life. No way. We're called to a life of virtue. We're called to a life of holiness because, and I think Madage had said this uh, in, a, in one of the other sessions, all sin leads to destruction. There is no harmless sin, right? And so this will bear fruit. Uh, even the images and the relationships and the things we've seen. I was reading, I think it was Matthew the Poor um, who was talking about this. But he was saying, Satan, any image that we've ever seen, anything that we've ever experienced in this way in, a, in fornication, Satan uses that even to rekindle the lust in us, right? Like he uses that against us, right? So to try and live a life of purity is not, you know, something that, 
it's it's for our own benefit. God is not trying to stop us from enjoying anything. He's really trying to give us our best life, the best life that he can give us uh, if we choose to cooperate with his path of trying to obey his commandments and when we fall to come in repentance before him. Um, and, and he will offer us his joy and his peace and his fulfillment and his perfect love. And then even in marriage, uh, we can experience that uh, to an even greater level. I think that's a good place to wrap it up here. Uh, Achin, I really do appreciate you taking time to talk about this important issue. I know it's a lot to co- cover, but as you said, I think it's very important. And I'm very happy that we were able to have you on with us today. Thank you, Ruben. I do feel, you know, I do want to ask forgiveness, especially from other clergy and anyone who may be leading pastorally. If I've said anything against what they would want, this is just, I, again, I don't I don't speak officially, but I do try, I'm just trying to share what I've, what I've come with it. And um, again, really just trying to, I, I do think everyone, every, especially everybody, and especially the young people growing up, but everybody should be addressing this struggle in their life. Like it has to be addressed. It needs to be addressed. It will be for our spiritual benefit when each and every one of us do that. And clergy are included in that, by the way, right? Like all of us are included. Like we all are called to address the struggle, to go in confession and to repent in whatever that struggle may be for us when it comes to this. And for anyone, you know, who has any questions or concerns um, about the struggle or any struggle, as we said before, please try to reach out to your spiritual father um, if you want, you know, we have the Diocese and MGOC some resources listed in our description. Um, so please feel free to reach out. I hope everyone continues to stay safe. Please stay tuned for another episode of Chaya Chats.